Hello, good afternoon, welcome. My name is Nick Zola. We'll get started in about 60 seconds. Thank you for joining us today. Hello again and welcome for those of you who have just come on. We'll be starting in about 45 seconds or so. Thanks for joining us today. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for coming today. We'll get started in maybe another 20 seconds or so, letting the last few people join us. Good afternoon. My name is Nick Zola. I am an associate professor of religion and uh, I work in the religion and philosophy division of Seaver College at Pepperdine University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Payson Library special event with special collections and a virtual tour of historic Bibles hosted by Melissa Nikonen, whom I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, one of my primary areas of research and specialty is ancient biblical manuscripts. And the presentation that you are about to receive and see is very similar to one that I invite my own students to participate in uh, each and every semester, in fact. Uh, ancient Bibles, whether they are handwritten or printed, are, uh, are like windows, I think, into religious communities. They're more than, than simply artifacts that we would use to reestablish some ancient text. They are living documents. They tell a story uh, of their time and of the people who were using them. And this is why I'm drawn to studying ancient texts and why this presentation I think is so vitally important. It doesn't just tell other people's stories, it tells our own story as well. Uh, I'd like to thank the libraries for organizing this event. The libraries prides itself in bridging people together and building community. Events like the one today are open to a general audience and we're delighted to inspire learning no matter what your affiliation to Pepperdine. Uh, following today's lecture, there will be a question and answer session, which means that during the course of lecture, you can use the uh, button down below that says chat to uh, submit questions to Melissa or the panelists who will be facilitating that. Uh, and uh, another uh, member of the library services team will be facilitating that Q&A. So at this point, I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, Melissa Nikonen who is Associate University Librarian for Special Collections and University Archives. Melissa has an MSLIS degree from the University of Illinois, and she's worked in Special Collections at Pepperdine for the last 11 years. Uh, Melissa regularly teaches sessions on history of the book and archival sources for classes in art history, in religion, in history, in digital humanities, in English, and in international studies and languages. Melissa's primary interests are the material culture of the book and the preservation of cultural heritage and the development of diverse cultural heritage collections. Today, as I've already mentioned, Melissa will be speaking on the topic of historic Bibles in Pepperdine's special collections. So it's my great pleasure to bring you now, Melissa Nikonen. Thank you, Nick. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I am so excited to have this time to share some materials from our collections with you. Over the past few years, I've been fortunate enough to work with Professor Zola and many other professors in religion, art history, and English to share Pepperdine's collection of historic Bibles with our students. It's always such a pleasure because the students really seem to connect the, what they're learning in class with the objects that we are able to show them in special collections. So when Jeff, our library's director of public programming, asked me about doing some virtual special collections presentations, I knew I'd want to start with this one. As the most widely distributed book in the world, the Bible has had an extraordinary impact on cultures, languages, and faith traditions for centuries. 
Also, the Bible is so central to Pepperdine's curriculum and mission. Over its long history, the Bible's taken many physical forms from parchment scrolls to early printed books on paper. The text itself has also been rendered in different ways, most notably translated from the ancient Greek and Hebrew into Latin, and then later eventually into vernacular languages like English. And all of these translations have also been interpreted through commentary and supplemented with maps and diagrams and other images. Today, I'm excited to share with you five items from our special collections that represent some of this history. We don't have nearly enough time for a comprehensive history of the Bible, but by looking at a few examples that represent some milestone moments in the history of the Bible, I'm hoping you'll come away with a deeper understanding of the Bible's history and how it's linked to the development of book technology. I'm going to be using our document camera to share these items with you live, so I apologize in advance for any technological hiccups that sometimes come along with this live technology, especially as I uh, move the camera up and down to account for uh, quite a variety of sizes of materials that we're going to look at today. So let's get started. I'm going to share our first item. Okay, there we go. So the first item I want to show you today is a scroll of the book of Esther. Going back to the very beginning, the oldest biblical texts that we have were written as scrolls. So you're probably familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in the 20th century, and those were produced between the 3rd century BCE to the 1st century CE. At Pepperdine, we don't have any manuscripts that are nearly that old, but we do have a few scrolls. So this scroll, as I mentioned, is the Book of Esther. It was produced around 1800, and it was written in Hebrew. It, although it's not that old, comparatively speaking, it still gives us a sense of what it was like to use scrolls in the ancient times and how they might have functioned. It also represents an ongoing tradition in Judaism to write the scriptures on scrolls. This uh, scroll in particular, the Esther scroll, is read at the Festival of Purim. Okay, so let's take a look inside. One thing you might notice is that the outer layers of this scroll um, look pretty worn and used and dirty, uh, which is, is as it should be since this is the exterior and there's no writing on the exterior. But when we get in here, you can see that it's been protected and it's um, much cleaner, although still showing some signs of use. The material that this is written on is parchment. And parchment is animal skin that's been stretched and scraped. It's gone through a long process, um, including soaking, stretching, and then scraping. It's a very strong writing surface, and it can last for centuries. Um, and it was used for centuries because of how strong it is. And also because of its smooth surface was uh, really good for writing. Another writing surface that you might have heard of is papyrus. And papyrus was made from the stems of papyrus plants that were um, laid down flat in one layer and then in a second layer at right angles uh, to make the papyrus more, uh, to make it stronger. And biblical manuscripts, the first and earliest biblical manuscripts would have been written on both parchment and papyrus. I just want to point out a few interesting features of this scroll. Um, the first that you'll notice is this blank page at the beginning, which is really common um, helps protect the text and make sure that any damage that happens to the outside is not happening to the first page of text. And then you might also notice, you can see it on this blank page, um, these uh, very faint lines here. And this is what we call ruling. Ruling was used to help the scribe uh, make the writing straight. And in some cases, the ruling is provided as um, ink or pencil lines. But in this case, it's what we call blind ruling. And so a sharp tool was used to create the ruling lines, um, but no, no ink or pencil can be seen on them. As we go in a little bit, we can see that there are um, multiple columns of text. And as this is Hebrew, uh, we will be reading from right to left. One of the things I find really interesting about this scroll in particular is this place where it's sewn together. So you can see that there's some stitching right here um, where two pieces of parchment have been sewn together. And if I turn it over, you can see what that looks like on the back side. The sewing is something that's regularly used with parchment documents 
um, in this case to put two pieces together, but in other cases, sewing is used to repair holes or other kinds of damage to manuscripts. Um, this also represents one of the limitations of scrolls. So as you can imagine, um, a scroll is limited in how much content will fit on one particular scroll. Uh, in this case, multiple pieces of parchment were needed, and that would also be very common with papyrus to attach multiple pieces together. But there's still a limit to how long uh, the piece could be. And so, for example, if we think of the Isaiah scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, that one, I believe, is about 24 feet. And if you go online, you can see all 24 feet laid out, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, but that was one of the longer scrolls. So, so there is certainly a limitation on the size of the text that could be included in a scroll. Uh, the other element that you might notice too, as I'm you know, scrolling through this way, is that if you were to try to find a particular place in the text as a reference, it's a little bit uh, difficult. It's a little difficult to find uh, particular references and takes a little bit of time. So that's one of the other limitations of scrolls. But scrolls were extremely popular for a really long time and they remained in use for uh, centuries and even today are part of the ongoing tradition in Judaism of um, scroll making with uh, biblical texts and the, the Hebrew scriptures. I also just brought this um, feather quill to show you. So this quill was used in the making of the St. John's Bible, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but this is also a good example of the kind of tool that would be used for writing early manuscripts such as this scroll or some of the other manuscripts we'll see today. So early, I'm going to move my camera. This is one of those technological moments. So early biblical texts were found on separate scrolls and they weren't compiled into one book as we think of it until much later. However, we do have some exceptions to this. And so what I'm gonna show you now is the um, Codex Sinaiticus. And this is an example of, um, of a time when all of the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament was combined into one book, which wouldn't happen very regularly for many more centuries, but we do have one fantastic example of it here. So the Codex Sinaiticus, um, was written in approximately the fourth century CE. And what we have here is a facsimile of the codex. So this facsimile was produced in the 19th century, um, shortly after the codex was discovered. Most of the original codex is bound into two volumes at the British Library, and then some additional fragments are held uh, in other libraries as well. The Codex Sinaiticus is really important. Um, as I mentioned, it included the entire Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament was provided um, in Greek as the Greek Septuagint. And then the New Testament was of course in Greek as well, since that was its original language. What we're looking at here is the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see a little bit better. If you know Greek letters, you might be able to see um, the name of the book of Mark here. And then we can also see that this is the end, which is kind of indicated by this um, decorative scroll work here. And then a note that this book is ending and the next is beginning. One thing to note about um, this codex is this beautiful handwriting. So this is what we call the unshield style. These are uh, Greek capital letters. And um, I think they're really quite impressive. The handwriting on this is really beautiful. Um, there are four columns on each page, which you might've noticed when we were zoomed out. So it has a little bit of the look of a scroll. If you were to, to unroll a scroll fully and see different columns of text, this has kind of the same look as that. A lot of effort was made with the Codex Sinaiticus to be accurate and correct. So in the manuscript, many corrections are seen and it's clear that there was a really strong effort made to make this a very accurate manuscript. The one thing to note is that this is not the start of a tradition. Um, as I mentioned, in a, a complete Bible at this time was extremely rare. And the fact that this was discovered in the 19th century has been extremely important for biblical scholarship. 
um, but it's not something that we would see regularly again for, um, for many more centuries. There are so many things we could talk about in regards to the Codex Sinaiticus, but one that I want to point out today is the rise of the Codex as a book format. The Codex simply means the book format that we know today, which is a rectangular object with hard covers and pages that turn, usually with text on both sides of the pages. Many New Testament manuscripts are codices rather than scrolls, and often the spread of the use of codex is associated with the rise of Christianity. There could be a number of reasons for this, but it's likely that it was less expensive to produce codices, partly because the text could be written on both sides of the pages. And as we noted with the scroll, there's a limit to how much content can be easily used in one scroll, um, as well as if you're trying to reference something in the middle of the text, rather than reading it straight through, it's much easier to navigate to the right spot in a codex than in a scroll. So for a time, both scrolls and codices were used, although sometimes for different purposes, but eventually the codex took over as the predominant format for books. Although, as I mentioned earlier, scroll making does continue in the Jewish tradition. So with the next item that I'm going to share with you, we are going to jump far into the future, into the 13th century. But before we jump into the 13th century, um, I wanted to just say a few things about the intervening years. So in the fourth century, when the Codex Sinaiticus was produced, there was a lot of other work going on with the Bible at this time as well. Um, one of the more notable things going on in the fourth and fifth centuries and, and beyond are the translations of the Bible that start to appear. So the Bible is translated into languages such as Coptic, um, Armenian, Georgian, and Ethiopic, amongst others. And one of the more notable translations um, in the early days, especially um, this was taking place in the fourth century, is the translation by St. Jerome of the Bible into Latin. The Bible had been translated into Latin in the past, but Jerome took on a new project and, um, and it was a, a massive project, but the result was what we call the Latin Vulgate or the common Latin. And this um, took a little while to catch on, but became an extremely important, extremely um, popular and well-used translation of the Bible. It had a big impact on further translations of the Bible as well. So during this time, Bibles were mostly handwritten in codices with just a portion of the biblical text. For example, it was very common to find a volume of the Gospels or a volume of the Psalms. So these were the kinds of manuscripts um, that we would find from this time period. Also, certainly liturgical manuscripts that had portions of the scripture as well. So documents that would be used to guide the service of the, the Mass or other kinds of um, religious services in the monasteries and in other places. Um, manuscripts also tended to be quite large for the most part. So that brings us to the 13th century with another very dramatic shift in uh, Bible production. And I'm going to share our next item here. There we go. So in the 13th century, Bibles went through some significant changes. And some of these we can see in this manuscript here, uh, which is a 13th century manuscript. Um, some of those changes include uh, that manuscripts became much, much smaller. Um, it's a little bit hard to see on screen, but this is very tiny writing. I'll just kind of like try to give you my finger for scale. Very, very tiny writing here in this manuscript. Um, another big change is that we see the Bible in one book. So as I mentioned, the Codex Sinaiticus did this, but most other manuscripts at the time did not include the entire Bible. But in the 13th century, we see this happening much more frequently and becoming more the norm. Um, also in the 13th century, we get standardized chapter numbers, uh, which certainly helps with referencing different parts of the Bible. Um, and in the past, uh, Bibles had been sometimes numbered, sections of the Bible had been numbered, but it was not consistent from one manuscript to another. And so this made it more consistent as to um, where in the book of a Bible you were, you could reference a particular uh, chapter number. At the same time, um, the order of the books of the Bible that we know today was being standardized. And so um, for the first time, the books of the Bible are appearing in an order that's pretty similar to what we know today. 
So this is a leaf from the book of Nehemiah, which you can see written up here. And this is the beginning of Nehemiah. So we see here um, a larger initial letter that starts off uh, the book of Nehemiah. And then, as I mentioned, since the, um, since the chapter numbers were starting to be uh, standardized, we can see some chapter numbers in the margins here. So here we see chapter two. And then in the text, you can see the capital letter um, E that starts chapter two. And interestingly, uh, the scribe who was writing the script wrote a, a smaller E off into the caption. Um, and probably there was a number two over on the other side as well. Uh, so that when the rubricator came through later to add the red, um, they would know that the first letter was an E and that this was chapter two. We see a couple of those indications on the back side of this leaf as well. Um, which we can take a look at. So here we have uh, chapter three starting, and then chapter four, I think, is one of the more interesting ones because we can see the rubricators, chapter four, and then the larger red initial letter here. And then we can see way off to the side the scribe's note that it should be uh, this letter and then this chapter number. And these, you know, probably were meant to be um, in the binding, so you wouldn't see them, but we're lucky enough that we get to see a little bit of this clue of how this manuscript was produced. Um, so this is on parchment, and it's a very fine and delicate form of parchment. And this is part of the reason why Bibles were able to be so much smaller uh, in the uh, thir beginning in the 13th century is that they created a parchment that was much, much thinner. Uh, it's kind of like Bibles today often have very thin pages. Um, so this is just incredibly thin and delicate. And um, we're not 100% sure how this kind of parchment was produced, but it could have been that it was just um, stretched and scraped for a lot longer period of time until it was thin. Um, it also could have been that there was some separation of the skin uh, into thinner sheets. But regardless, uh, we have a very fine parchment uh, page here. So this is just, as you notice, probably this is just one single leaf from the book of Nehemiah. And this would have been found as part of an entire Bible at one point. Uh, but somewhere along the line, it got separated from the rest of the book. So what we have is just the single leaf. In the early Middle Ages in Europe, manuscript production was often taking place in the context of the monasteries. But by the 13th century, when this Bible was written, there are workshops and centers for manuscript production in some of the cities. We also see at the same time um, the development of universities in many cities. And so it's thought that these manuscript production centers were somewhat related to the universities and probably helped provide texts for the universities. The small Bibles of the 13th century, however, um, there's some evidence that part of the reason they became so popular was because of the Dominican and Franciscan friars who were traveling preachers. And so having a small portable book that included the entire Bible was really essential to the work of the friars. And as this rose, as, the, um, as there were more and more friars, um, as prevalent traveling preachers, there was more and more demand for these small manuscript Bibles. And so especially in France, we see lots and lots of them um, being produced. That doesn't mean they were cheap. They were still very expensive um, and would have been difficult for anyone but the most wealthy to own them. Um, but they are produced in, in quite great numbers. Um, and were evidently very popular at the time. So writing the Bible, as you can imagine, was very difficult work. As I mentioned, this script is, is so tiny, it's, it's almost hard to imagine what it would have been like to write. Um, and it could have taken a very long time to write a book like this, which is part of the reason for the expense of these manuscripts. And then uh, the language. So the language of this leaf is the Latin Vulgate, which we were just talking about. Um, that was translated by St. Jerome in the fourth century. And this would have been the primary language used in European churches uh, at the time, although Orthodox churches continued to use Greek. So
So although we don't have time to look at them today, Pepperdine does have two liturgical manuscripts that are full codices where you can see all of the um, parchment leaves bound together in a codex. And one of these is, is sort of a medium size and another is quite large. Um, and then we also have some leaves that are just enormous. So there were very different sizes of manuscripts and primarily that's related to purpose. Um, whereas this manuscript Bible was meant to be carried, um, possibly used in someone's home. These other manuscripts were meant to be used in the context of a service and perhaps a whole group of people would be singing from one manuscript at a time. And so they were so large so that everyone um, could see the text and the notes and that kind of thing. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the 15th century. And in the 15th century, we see another huge transition in the history of Bibles. And this of course is uh, when Gutenberg prints the Bible, the Latin Bible in the 1450s in Germany. So Gutenberg is not the first to use printing technology, not by a long shot. Um, there, were, there was printing taking place for centuries in Asia, um, particularly in China and in Korea. For example, our, uh, our, oldest, um, our oldest extant printed book is from China in the ninth century. And Gutenberg was printing in the 15th century. So this is a full 600 years uh, before Gutenberg that printing is taking place in China. So when Gutenberg started printing in the 1450s, um, he used, and then the other printers that came after him, used individual pieces of metal type, one piece for each letter. And I have a few examples to show you here. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see these on the screen. These are quite, um, by my camera. These are sort of large pieces of type, but at printing workshops, the printers, depending on the size and, and how much they could afford, would have several different typefaces and several different sizes so that they could accommodate different text styles and different text sizes within their books. Um, the basic process of printing involves compiling the pieces of type together into the text. And so this is called composing. And this is done by pulling out individual letters and putting them in lines of text and then putting the lines of text into paragraphs or columns or pages and then locking it up on the bed of the press. I'm sure that this gets easier with practice, but I once did this for a short recipe and it took me hours upon hours to do 10 lines of text. So I can just imagine how difficult it must have been for those working in the print shop and putting together these large books. The letters are all in reverse, which is where we get the phrase, mind your P's and Q's, because the P's and the Q's, of course, would be very easy to mix up and were sometimes, in fact, mixed up with each other. It's also where we get the phrase uppercase and lowercase letters, since the uppercase letters were literally in the uppercase uh, wooden case of type and the lowercase letters were in the lowercase of type. So once the sorts or the type, the individual pieces of type are grouped together into a page and they're on the bed of the press and locked up, the type would be inked and then a sheet of paper is pressed onto the inked type to create a printed page. So if you wanna end up with say 200 copies of a book, you would print off 200 copies of this page or group of pages, and then you would move on to the next page or group of pages and print off 200 copies of that page. And you would do that for each page of the book until you had the full book printed. So getting to this point is a lot of work. The paper is handmade, the type is cast from metal. Um, and of course, the composing the type and printing the pages is all an immense amount of work. But at the end of the process, you might have 100 books or 200 books rather than just one handwritten book. So the implications of this are immense. Books are still expensive, but they're more accessible than they've ever been. And this has a huge impact on the Bible. Okay, so for our next item, I want to show you um, a Geneva Bible. <laughs> Sorry, my camera is not quite in the position we need it to be. Here we go. So this is the title page of the Geneva Bible, and this was produced in 1560. 
So about 100 years after Gutenberg prints his famous Bible. And the Bible is translated into English, in this case, from Hebrew and Greek by English Protestants. But it's not printed in England. It's actually printed in Geneva, Switzerland, which is where we get the nickname Geneva Bible. And um, the reason for this is because this was during Queen Mary's reign. And as she was Catholic, the Protestant translators um, were working in Switzerland. This was an unauthorized translation of the Bible. But despite being an unauthorized translation, it was extremely popular and an extremely important translation into English. It predates the King James Bible by about 50 years. Um, and the translation is really well done. The translators make special note on the title page here that they're translating this from the Hebrew and Greek. And this is really important because many Bibles to this point have been translated from the Latin Vulgate into other languages. But during the 16th century, we see a lot of Bibles in vernacular languages like in English and in German being translated directly from Hebrew and Greek sources. So we have to keep in mind that the translators didn't have access to all of the sources that we have today. So for example, the Codex Sinaiticus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, those weren't discovered until the 19th or 20th centuries. So these translators did not have access to those sources, but they did have access to other Greek and Hebrew sources. And they made a point um, to go back to those original sources. The Geneva Bible has a lot of fascinating features. So it was the first English Bible that used chapter and verse divisions, which you can see here. It used a Roman typeface, which was very legible. This was definitely a book that was meant to be readable. It was meant to be um, read at home. So very much in line with the Protestant Reformation, um, the translators and producers of this Bible wanted something that was really accessible to people. Um, it includes a lot of maps and diagrams. So we see a couple of diagrams here. Um, this is in the book of Exodus. So we have a couple of diagrams of, um, of different things that are being described. And all of these diagrams are made with woodblock prints. So this means that the wood, the image would be carved into wood in relief, and then it could be printed alongside the type. The other thing about the Geneva Bible is that it was small. So the small format made it a bit easier to use as well. This is not something you would see in the front of the church, but something that you would see in someone's home. You can see, um, maybe I'll just find a place to stop for a second. You can see that the text um, is in English, but at this time, the English language is still being uh, standardized. And so we see some letter forms that might not look familiar and also a lot of spellings that are different. Um, so for example, we see lamb with an, a silent E at the end. So there's lots of silent E's at this time. Um, and just generally the spelling is, is slightly different from what we would expect, but it is very readable um, if you, were to take a moment to read part of it, you, you know, would definitely be able to read it. And in fact, it might sound quite familiar because the language of the Geneva Bible was referenced and borrowed for the King James Bible, um, which has really gone on to impact a lot of our translations of the Bible and, um, and not just the Bible itself, but also the English language more generally. So a lot of phrases and um, come from the translation of the Bible. Well, the work of Bible making continues. And so of course we all know about standard Bibles you can buy on Amazon or in bookshops, but big uh, Bible making projects uh, are still take place. So in our fine press collection, we have a number of books that are beautiful representations of the Bible or parts of the Bible. But the one I wanna show you today is the most recent of these and that's the St. John's Bible. Um, it's a very large book, so just bear with me while I get the camera set up. It'll just take a minute here. Okay. 
Okay, so the St. John's Bible um, is a major project that was started in um, 1998. This is a project that was commissioned by the St. John's Abbey and University in Minnesota. Turn on my screen, you can see this. And it's so large, it's difficult to get it all on the screen, but I'll try to get a little bit more of it on the screen for you. So this is a huge contrast from the um, medieval manuscript Bible that we were looking at. So it was commissioned in 1998, and I'm just gonna flip through, um, like talk about it a little bit. So please feel free to just enjoy some of the illustrations um, and we'll try to zoom in on some of the text in a little bit as well. The writing of the Bible, um, or the creative direction of the Bible, I should say, was by Donald Jackson, who's a calligrapher um, in, who lives in Wales, and he's a, a really well-known calligrapher. And his life's goal was always to handwrite, to create a manuscript version of the Bible. So he and St. John's Abbey um, combined their efforts on this project, and between him and about six other calligraphers, the project took between the year 2000 and then it was finished up in 2011. Um, the six calligraphers added the text. So Donald Jackson developed the script um, and, and maybe this is a good time to zoom in so you can see the script a little bit better. So even though there were lots of individuals working on it, they were trained to use the same script. So there's consistency from page to page. In addition, there were six artists who also worked on the project. And so you can see these you know, really beautiful um, pages of illustrations, some of them that are text-based and some that are not. The original of the St. John's Bible was written on parchment and it was written using feather quills. So like the one I showed you earlier is actually a quill um, that was given to us by Donald Jackson. This copy that we're looking at is called the Heritage Edition. And the Heritage Edition of the St. John's Bible um, is a fine art reproduction. And it was made using the most advanced technology at the time for printing. Um, so they printed on handmade cotton paper and um, used a printing technology that um, I believe utilized ultraviolet light to dry the ink. Uh, so that was a really um, significant, you know, in contrast to the medieval nature of making the original, the making of the heritage edition was, was uh, very technologically advanced. But at the same time, it um, also involved a lot of handwork. And so um, the gold foil is embossed and in some cases has been manipulated um, to have a certain uh, sheen to it that matches the original. So a lot of work went into this. The translation that is used is the New Revised Standard version of the Bible. And one of the things you might note are these um, little red and blue flags, which kind of mimic the uh, red and blue you often see in medieval manuscripts. And these indicate um, paragraph breaks because in the New Revised Standard version of the Bible, there are paragraph breaks. But in making the St. John's Bible, the artists and the calligraphers, they wanted to maintain this look of the two columns from, uh, from medieval manuscript Bibles. And so they um, compromised and used the flags as a way to indicate paragraph breaks. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the share. And this concludes the presentation part of our program. And, um, but we do have time for Q&A, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat and, um, and we will try to answer as many as we can. I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Bowen now, my colleague, who's our director for library programming and he'll be facilitating the Q&A. Okay, we've had a couple of questions already come in. Um, the first is about acquisitions. Melissa, how does Pepperdine acquire these materials? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so there's 
different ways that Pepperdine acquires our rare materials. Um, but in particular, when it comes to revivals, many, many of them have been donated to us. And in particular, a lot of them, including at least three of the ones I've shown today, have been donated to us by Martin Christensen Sr. And Martin Christensen Sr. was a friend and colleague of George Pepperdine, who was a founder um, of Pepperdine University. And uh, Martin Christensen had a fantastic collection of rare and historic Bibles. And his donations to Pepperdine um, took place over several decades, beginning, you know, at the very early days of the school and um, including up to, I know in 1970, he donated the library's 100,000th book. So he was, you know, he was doing a lot of uh, donating for a number of decades. And those Bibles really form the core of our Historic Bibles collection, um, but not just our Historic Bibles collection. I would say that Martin Christensen's donations also really formed the core of our Rare Books collection. So we're, of course, very grateful um, to, to him for his generous donations. Um, in particular, I know that the scroll, the Geneva Bible, and the Codex Sinaiticus all came from his collections, as well as many, many more Bibles. And then as far as some of the other items, um, you know, a, a lot of our items come through donation and some come through strategic acquisitions. And so, for example, the St. John's Bible is one that we knew we wanted to acquire. Uh, we felt like it was so appropriate for Pepperdine and would be so useful to our community here. Um, and so we had, I believe, about four donors step up and make the purchase of the St. John's Bible uh, to give to the university. Another attendee asks, uh, could you talk about when and how in the future we might be able to come to Pepperdine to see these selections? That is such a good question. So I can't say much about the when, <laughs> um, but we hope soon, of course. And we would absolutely love to have anyone come and see these materials. Um, so we're located in Payson Library and our collections are here to be used. So we really encourage our students to come and use the collections and our faculty and staff, um, as well as members of the public. Um, our students, I would say, primarily use our collections through their classes, and so either they come for a class visit with their professor, or which right now is all virtual, but um, someday soon we'll be again in person. Um, and sometimes they have projects that require use of special collections, so they'll come back and do a, a more advanced research in special collections here. But we certainly have researchers from around the world come to use our collections and from our own community. And I would say once we're opened up, you know, please feel free to contact us. We'd love to show these materials to anyone with an interest. Another person asks, if you could see and touch any historic Bible that you have not yet encountered personally, Melissa, what Bible would it be? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I love the Geneva. If you couldn't tell, I think the Geneva Bible is a really fantastic Bible. So I feel really lucky to be able to work with that one. Um, I mean, I think the Gutenberg Bible is pretty remarkable and I've been able to see the Gutenberg Bible a couple of times. Um, there's one at the Huntington, which is local to Pepperdine. So that's a wonderful place to see it. Um, but it, seeing it behind glass is a little different than using it. So of course it would be fantastic to be able to um, look at it more up close and personal. Uh, another attendee asks, uh, why do we only have one leaf of the medieval manuscript as opposed to an entire book? Yeah, that's such a good question. So this leaf that I shared with you today comes from a portfolio that was put together by a scholar named Otto Eggy, and he was working in the 20th century, like the mid 20th century. Um, and one thing that he uh, wanted to do was to encourage awareness and use of medieval manuscripts. He created these portfolios where he took manuscripts and he broke them apart into pieces and then shared um, individual leaves as part of these portfolios. So we have an auto Aggy portfolio, and that's where this leaf comes from. Um, the field of special collections and the manuscript world 
certainly does not um, appreciate book breaking. So that's not something that's encouraged um, by any means. And some of the things that are uh, kind of difficult are that uh, with just one leaf, um, it can be difficult to get a lot of information about the book. So like the one we looked at today, we could see the chapter numbers, but we couldn't see anything like an owner's inscription that probably would have been at the beginning of the book or other contextual information that would help us understand uh, the, the Bible or the manuscript. Um, but one thing that is truly wonderful is that in this digital age, uh, more and more institutions are digitizing their manuscripts and are able to digitally recreate some of the manuscripts from the past. So in particular, um, because Otto Eggie is so infamous as a book um, portfolio maker, I guess we'll say, a lot of universities have his portfolios. And as they digitize the pages from the portfolios, we can kind of recreate the manuscript um, online, which is an incredible opportunity. I uh, had another question just pop up. Uh, which historic Bible that Pepperdine owns do you enjoy showing and teaching students the most from? Well, that for me, that's definitely the Geneva Bible. Um, and I think that what I like about the Geneva Bible is that it has a lot of implications for a lot of different subject areas. So, of course, it's of great interest to religion students, um, but also because of the woodblock prints, it's really important in terms of art history and the history of printing methodologies. Um, and also because of its role in the development of the English language, it's important for English students to see. Um, but that said, we have a number of other early printed Bibles that I think are really fascinating. Um, one actually, I think I might have it here, is a little Psalter. And so this is one of my current favorite books. It's really tiny um, and it's just the book of Psalms in a verse, but it's just a really lovely little miniature book um, and has a lot of great uh, annotations in it and uh, other thing, other marginalia that make it really interesting. Uh, and that's it for questions, unless someone has uh, any final questions they want to throw in the chat box in the next few seconds. Okay, well, I think um, we can wrap up now, um, unless, uh, Melissa, do you have any uh, final thoughts you want to uh, share? No, just thank you all so much for coming and hopefully you'll be able to see these materials in person soon. And I just wanna say that we have several events coming up in April, um, including another special collections virtual tour. Um, that one is on Malibu tiles and it's going to be presented by Kelsey Knox, our university archivist. And that's on Monday, April 26 at 3 p.m. Um, you can RSVP for this and other events at library.pepperdine.edu slash events. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for sharing your wonderful insights. It's uh, been a pleasure learning all about historic Bibles. And to our attendees, thank you all so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at future library events.